All right, everybody, welcome to Cyber Bulls. So today we've got the Bulls, we've got Alexandra Mertz, we've got James from Invest Answers, and we've got Larry Goldberg. The story today is, well, how are we looking at Tesla? And I think you might be surprised that, that some of the folks here are seeing multiple growth stories that are upcoming. Let's start with you, James, and share, share with us your thinking about Tesla and what you see coming in the very near future for it. Yeah, well, I, I try and break it down into a couple of different things. First of all, is understand the competitive advantage of the firm across everything that they do. Like, it's still hard to believe that many people consider it a car company when they have energy storage solutions, they have an integrated software stack, they have the most incredible manufacturing efficiency, they do insurance for crying out loud. They have uh, all sorts of things in the hopper that are very exciting, like Dojo, which many, I think many people believe here on this panel that they're very sandbagged on. The Optimus bot is very real. The Optimus bot also has the capabilities that will come from the car, the ability to use AI neural networks to make decisions in real time. Um, the financial position is kind of stunning as well. Uh, and to, we can dig more into the financials, but when you see exactly how much cash this company spins off, it's quite stunning. Um, other stuff that other companies can't do, like over the air updates, <laughs> the battery technology is beginning to scale now on the 4680 side. They are dominant when it comes to, to vertical integration. Their price advantage is further ahead than anybody else. Literally, uh, I think it was Jay Leno. I saw his show. He was with France and Lars. And Jay Leno was stunned at <laughs> the price point of 35K for the Model 3 refresh after driving it. He was literally saying, how is this possible? I mean, it's a super luxury vehicle with a ton of technology at a Toyota Camry price or less, which confused him. And, and there's so much more. So I just think there's a, a lot of <coughs> domination there that makes this company second to none. And then the second angle is kind of, Catalysts for 2024. What will Model 3 refresh do? What's happening with Model Y? Will the Juniper come? And and, and so much more. How close is FSD version 12? Uh, Larry, you're tight on the Cybertruck ramp up. I think we'll get 70 to 80, maybe even 100,000 cars. You got the new Mega Pack factory in Shanghai coming, another 40 gigawatt hours as well. Um, mega pack growth, huge mega pack margins. You're going to have more of an uptick for FSD, especially if there's a greater rollout of version 12. Um, and semi truck in Nevada is going to be ramping up now as well. Model two is coming. The roadster news was mind blowing that that, that would, that should put, should put the fear of God into every luxury sports car maker on the planet, because they know the roadster is going to be cheaper faster, more capable. Um, and I heard as well that, and I didn't know this, I just learned this today, that there's a whole bunch of Formula One engineers mm. at Tesla that do things like design tires, design mm. aero. And if you know anything about Formula One cars, that's kind of special. So and nothing nothing but goodness. I just think it is, it is a very exciting time to be in this asset, especially when it's so underappreciated. And uh, I made a joke earlier today that I seem to be very good at finding misunderstood assets or most hated mm -hmm. assets. And I think that's good as an investor. But love to hear from the team here as to what they all think about future catalysts and yeah. insurmountable advantages that Tesla has. Is there Before even a company that, like yeah. this on the planet? Can we can we show them your chart? And I just want you to explain this. The Tesla domination story, uh, I know it's hard to read. Uh, I might be able yeah. to uh, get in closer, but go ahead and tell me what this is. Yeah, I was just thinking out loud last night in, in preparation for being here with you guys is thinking of all the different stuff that they do, but things that they do that no other company does. Okay, so you start with, let's start at noon. So like Dojo, they're building their own silicon optimized for training. Okay, nobody, no other manufacturer is doing this, uh, not even building it with the exception of maybe NVIDIA. Um, then you have competition. It's been proven recently. They have no competition in the BEV space and BEVs are real, okay? Uh, then the battery technology, yes, there's been a slow rollout for 4680s. Um, they do have solar products, but that's had a couple of full starts. But 
when you see how far they are ahead, even things like over the air updates, like a friend of mine has a Ford F-150 Lightning. He can't update it to save his life. Another friend of mine has one of those Volkswagen Golfs. He can't update it over the air. And Tesla's been doing it flawlessly for nine years. And it just shows you whatever they do, they do it really well. Then you've got the expansion of gigas around the world. You've got all the competition is retrenching and Tesla's expanding and they're building new products, chips, bots, et cetera. Um, other stuff, direct sales model. Some companies have tried it. They've all failed. It's really, really challenging to pivot from selling through a channel to selling direct. Then the supercharger network, that's another global domination story. Everybody's folding into it. You got it, vertical integration that doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. You got extreme customer loyalty and customer satisfaction when you compare it to other uh, vehicle brands. Brand recognition that was really brought to the fore with all of the celebrities getting their cyber trucks. The amount of cash they kick off is insane. The charging infrastructure, <laughs> the insurance, manufacturing efficiency, integrated software stack. I think Jeff talks to that a lot. How they have one stack they built themselves, you know, ERP, CRM, analytics, you name it, supply chain management, all in one stack where they can spin up the spec of what they need from a supplier if they even have a supplier for it in a heartbeat. And of course, energy storage. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's just some random thoughts here thrown on a page to really ask you guys if I'm smoking something or they really are a dominant player across the board. The company and the product don't look at the quarterly stock movement. As a trader, I got to take some off the table and wait for a better price. A very realistic bull. Questioning certain decisions. The rational bull. We enjoy listening to bears. We're looking for the red flags. You're supposed to react. Very yeah. comprehensive uh, thought. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I forgot refining. They refine lithium as well. I mean, well, there. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I stopped by that lithium refinery last year, earlier this year. No, it was last year. Um, on my way to Boca Chica, and boy, the construction there is quite impressive. I stopped there, and security came over and chased me away. <laughs> but it's very, very impressive. Um, that you know, and and they're doing a lot of research in doing that. Um, you know, Tesla won't do something that is not within their own within their mission and they see this as very much part of their mission notwithstanding that lithium prices have come down it's a question of availability and expansion and you know future capability and lithium is so central to it so they just do it it's amazing and they don't do it the way everybody else does it they only do it if they can improve the process quite dramatically yeah so, Larry, what did you think about his uh, global domination, all these things that are value prop uh, that differentiate Tesla from anybody else? You know, there are one or two areas where possibly other companies have shown some degree of capacity or capability and so on. Um, and, and the other thing I will say is that Tesla is um, probably, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at the end to end, I think one of the, one of the keys is that, that, isn't on the list is the new manufacturing approach, this new design and manufacturing, which is not yet proven. But but when you look at the unbox process, it is it it has within it the capability to revolutionize vehicle construction. And the importance of that is so, you know, you know, we've been manufacturing vehicles in exactly the same using exactly the same method now for a hundred years. Think about that. A hmm. hundred years, we've had this vehicle come down a production line in a straight line, as straight as you can keep it within the factory, adding pieces to it step by step. And the limit of production speed is determined by the length of the car because you start with the whole car end to end. With an electric car, you don't need a car end to end because you don't have, you know, a transmission running the length of the car. You can actually manufacture the car in components. And then at the end of and you don't have to construct it in a straight line. You can have multiple lines feeding into a central or into a into a production line. 
and you can then put those pieces together. That significantly reduces the size of the factory, which is gigantic. These car factories are enormous. And you can collapse the size of the factory and also reduce the complexity of having to paint a body before you actually put that body onto a car and have to have the body in parts and painted accompany the car down this long line. All of that is, you know, magical because it's going to convert, it's going to tra transform how we actually manufacture cars and make cars dramatically less expensive, dramatically less expensive to manufacture. And in fact, Larry, I did have a category there. I call it manufacturing prowess on the mind map. But uh, I, one other thing I did uh, mention, I walked the line, the Cybertruck line, with a former Ford engineer. Mm. Okay, he was blown away by yeah. the steps and how they were optimized for 45 to 60 second increments. I didn't even see that, but he could see from, there's like a dashboard above every stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not just that, the speed, but also the fact that each section was fully automated. Yeah. There's no humans there at all. And he was like, I'm ready for that because when you look at a GM, a Ford, or a Stellantis line, they're still hammering things together with humans. Exactly. This, this is a different ball game. And 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 the funny yeah. thing is, they're already so far ahead with them with the Cybertruck, and they're about to just step change that again with the Model Two line. Which again, I heard from Franz and Lars that that's already being built or nearly finished, and the Model Two is already at final spec. I think. But anyway, it's going to be crazy. It's past final spec now. I think they, yeah. they're busy putting in equipment and actually testing equipment. Yep. You know, one doesn't know because one only hears these little bits and pieces and puts them together. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when auto company engineers come and see that line, they are blown away. Yeah. I'm reminded, you know, there was a robotics company that put out a, a piece, put out a, a, a video of uh, they'd done a deal. It was uh, figure.ai had done a deal with BMW, have done a deal with BMW, and BMW is going to actually test the bot in, in, a, in a test in their factory. And they were showing video of this, this factory, and there were like eight people crowded around this, this BMW as it's coming down the line, you know, adjusting things and adding things and screwing screws and bolting bolts and banging I mean, rocks yeah I mean, I I mean, and putting on putting on wheels literally hmm. bolting on wheels you can see them building the wheel put the bolt when you see that in the tesla factory you just see this wheel coming wham yeah yep. the robot the kooka picks it up puts it in screws the uh, locates and screws the bolts you're done and you look down the product, the production line, and it is one long line with not a human being to be seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they told us, well, regarding regarding the wheels, that's just a small little detail. But a human isn't even strong enough to carry the Cybertruck wheel. It's too big and heavy. <laughs> so they, you, you can't even have a human do the job if you wanted Yeah. all day long. Can you imagine that's, throwing those four wheels you, on at 45 Alexandra? seconds? Yeah. What do you think sure. about the uh, so, his, his so I loved I loved uh, James's octopus. I'm you know I'm a simple girl, so I'm I'm doing this. Uh, why do you laugh, Larry? I'm doing this in a more historical manner. Um, I believe we have four big growth waves to come, but we still have to wait a little bit. Remember 2008, the Roadster. They sold 2,500 of those. Then. 2012, the Model S and X, they sold hundreds of thousands of them over time. Then 2017, the Model 3, the Model Y, they now sold millions of those. Now, right now, we're ready. We have the best manufacturing pros, how you called it, for the upcoming wave. And we need that for the upcoming waves. We have the, I hope you're right, Larry, end of 2025, $25,000 car. There will be tens of millions of this car built over time. So getting that manufacturing as precise straight away is the most important thing now to get to get done. The second way, so that's one wave. And this is a wave where we're going from millions of cars to tens of millions of cars. The second wave is the energy market offering. There's no doubt in my mind that we, we can double car revenue eventually with energy. 
And that will be become much more clear in 2025, probably, but most certain 2026. We have FSD. Well, we're seeing Bradford doing this wonderful uh, version 12 videos now. We're seeing, I don't know, remember his, his handle anymore, but this young man doing them in, in LA. Great videos, very well put in scene, showing the limits and showing how well it's doing in prior situations where version 11 was still handling. FSD, I'm not talking robotaxi yet, but FSD has the potential of 10 times the value of the $25,000 car because there are all the other cars that will have that. And then the fourth wave is obviously the, the bot wave. And that one is just, you know, gigantic in, in size. I don't expect that one to become money-wise relevant before 2026, but there are four distinct waves. Not all four may materialize as quickly as I want, but some will. There is no doubt in my mind. Each class has a class of innovation that is ahead of its competitors in all of them, in manufacturing, in, in neural net vision, in, in any aspect you see it. So the downside risk with the current stock price at $180 seems to me very limited. I'm not saying this cannot go down to 100 anymore if there's more screaming to be done, but I don't see this stock having a huge downside risk. I do see it having a huge upside potential. So what is currently depressing the stock? The stock, in my view, is currently depressed. Obviously, we still have high interest rates. We have some have the feeling that there are competitive uh, uh, EVs out there. We saw today Rivian announced their two new models. I mean, I hope they all survive, but they probably won't. Um, we have still people keeping the cars just because it's a, you know, it's a stretch to go to an EV. They sometimes pass by hybrids. They keep their cars longer. So there, there are situations that just stuck for a while. That's why I think 2026 is going to be the, the crucial year, but it could be coming, coming as early as 2025. Um, and so the, the whole addressable market for all these waves, for all these four waves, is just so much bigger and I want to just point out one last press that we haven't talked about is what they have learned by doing the Cybertruck. Because how many people do I hear screaming about, oh, they should have not done the Cybertruck, they should have gone straight away 25, times, whatever. First of all, 48 volt architecture. This is going to be the key piece for the $25,000 car. The stainless steel uh, exoskeleton. This could be the material for the robotaxis. The Robotaxis has a million mile batteries and has a stainless steel exoskeleton. It is going to be an undestructible car. So they, and mm -hmm. where did they learn it? By the Cybertruck ramp. The optimization of the 4680 batteries and everything that's associated with that. At the same time, Semi is still a small market, but Semi will help deliver those $25,000 cars. And the Roadster will be the element that will keep Tesla's image and the way it is perceived as a high-end car. By having this Roadster, people now screaming about, oh my gosh, they're doing this Roadster, is completely useless. No, this Roadster is going to mock people saying, okay, I can have a $25,000 car that is clear, nearly as good and has learned a lot from a Roadster that's probably going to fly or not. We'll see. Mm -hmm. So that's the, what I see. That's my notes for the current state of my mind. I'm not worried. I'm the calmest investor, accumulating, happy. And so can Alexander, I ask a question, Dan? Oh, sure. Go ahead, James. There's one thing I'd add, Alexander, which is so important too. You hit all the big bases, but the steer by wire is mm, also critical correct. for robot taxi. Correct. But it's also, if you look at car manufacturers, they have the biggest headache in the world of going from left-hand side to right-hand side steering. Sometimes they can't even do that. They can't even make You're that right. leap. Spot on. <laughs> so it put gives that, them so, many, on my list. You're so right. many more options, so many more options to do so much more. Yeah. So let, oh, let me Harvard, ask you this I, question. I came down. <laughs> yeah. I've learned a new trick. Apparently if I send the person up to the top left, then this happens easier. <laughs> So the question I want to ask you guys then, okay, so I'm a bull, you guys are all bulls, and uh, you guys have all just listed out all sorts of competitive advantages that Tesla mm -hmm. has, not only in business model, but efficiency, the factory, all the, uh, the things you listed in your mind map there, James, fantastic, well done, super appreciate you do that, because it reminds us all the advantages Tesla has. Then the question that people are asking is, well, then why hasn't it shown up? Why is it that today 
you know, Tesla hasn't blown away all its competitors. I just I mean, answered I think that, could, Herbert. I just I think answered you that. You can argue. Okay. Yeah, but but I just answered that. The, the big stuff is coming 2025, 2026. We're at the moment, I mean, Look. we're at the moment in a complicated environment for EVs anyway. Lots of subsidies have ended in lots of countries. The the OEMs suddenly feel some oxygen for for hybrids, so they're pushing that side. There, there, you know, there are a couple of reasons, but they're all temporary. None of those things. I mean, a hybrid owner becomes an EV owner next car. There is no doubt but, in my mind. Nobody's going to rebuy a second hybrid. Yeah, but you know, Alexander, the market <coughs> values earnings per share and revenue, and in their view, deliveries this year will result in a significantly reduced earnings per share. They're not factoring in all the factors that you're factoring in. Sure. They're not, and therefore they're looking at that earnings per share and they're saying at that earnings per share, current price of Tesla is this, you know, EPA, the, this uh, um, ratio, and that ratio is very high right now, and therefore they're marking it down. That it, It's pretty normal. I mean, NVIDIA right now is at is actually below the earning the the EPS ratio to to its stock price than Tesla is. Yeah. Well, Still. a year ago, NVIDIA was less than a half of its current price, mm -hmm. actually about a third of its current price, right? So was NVIDIA worth a third of its current price last year this time? No. Was anybody factoring in, you know, the the H100 success at this point, only those buyers who had the conviction that that would that that sale would mm -hmm. occur. So we're in the same boat. We're at a point where the market. I don't think it has anything to do with. I, I think it's just simply the market is not placing a value on these factors. I I, know, I hate calling them catalysts because they're not catalysts. Mm, these are they're real, working on them. Yeah, these are real factors that will impact the earnings per share of the company as we go through 27, 25, 26, and then you know, in up to twenty thirty. And we're kind of all right, but the stock price is not going to respond until these things become real and they start generating actual bottom line. I mean, one of the things we said is that that I heard said earlier is that. You know, energy is not yet growing, but it's coming. Well, energy doubled this year, literally doubled. Right. Energy is going to double again next year at a significantly higher margin because a very significant portion of the margin this year was deferred into the next three years. Exactly. So, deferred so the energy doubling is going to be real. It's quantifiable, can be seen. So, you know, those are the things that, are, I mean, this is kind of the bargain of the century type of situation. It's kind of like exactly. Bitcoin three years ago. It's kind of like NVIDIA two years ago. And this is not stock advice. This is if you feel you can quantify the, you know, as James has taken us through every data point step by step, if you feel you can quantify that and you feel the market hasn't valued that, then this is your, this is your beta. This is your value. This is, for you to actually, you know, make money out of. Does that make sense? It does, very much so. Who, who here invested in Tesla because and only because of the car business and seeing the car business uh, electric vehicle revolution? That's why you invested. I did. In 2020, I did because that's how, you know, I, I made my decision one night, right? I had a butt in the seat, came out of the car and said, we're going to sell everything else and buy everything in Tesla. So it was only on car business. I had no idea what I was doing, like no idea. So with so with the car business, did you, uh, were you surprised that instead of getting the 50% growth rate, we got the 30% where we're at today? And that's because of the macro um, and maybe other reasons. Are you Were you caught off guard because of that? 
No, because obviously since then I've done my homework. So 2020 to 2024 is four years. And, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it would be nice. The car business would continue growing at 50% every year until 2030. I remember I remember the initial uh, videos I watched from Warren and from Stephen Mark Ryan. Yeah, I just grew at 50% every year. It was wonderful, 25 million by 2030 and all that. I mean, it was probably a bit over over the top. Um, did I expect it to slow down as much? No, because I didn't expect China to become so quickly so competitive over there. China is the biggest car market. I mean, we've gone through this a lot of time, Herbert. And uh, and and by them, you know, start by Tesla lowering prices, but the Chinese had lower prices prior with, as well. So that market obviously drove drove um, a lot of the the margins and uh, and the growth potential. And then what, what about you, James? You're on mute. I think you're on mute. All right, you're on top of everything. You see everything. My, my story is a three-part story. First of all, I had a neighbor. Um, she had a young baby. I think she was a single mom. I can't remember the exact details. But she strapped her kid into the back of the car, turned it on. It was, I think, an Acura MDX. The garage door was closed. She said, oh, I forgot my phone, ran into the house, oh, no. got distracted, oh, no. did something. Literally, that, mm -hmm. that was a life and death situation. So since then, I didn't understand the amount of pollution given off by gas cars didn't like. Second of all, I've been watching Elon Musk for two decades, so I kind of knew what he was about. Third, uh, my brother-in-law is very tight with the owner of Lotus. And I've been to all the Formula One Grand Prix at Lotus. So from that kind of... The Lotus Roadster was kind of interesting, but I observed, got a little bit in 2017. In 2019, I was in Utah. I was in a Model X driving itself. I said, I got to buy one of these. I bought one a week later. And then I, after two or three days of being in the car, saying this is a car unthunk, I bought a ton of coal options on Tesla. <laughs> the rest is history. Um, and since then, I've just been blown away. Each day, I'll learn more uh, about the company. It opens up a new Pandora's box of where this thing is going in the future. And that that happened to me. So early moment 2017, then 2019, big bang. Wow, this is a special company. Very special company. So that's kind of like my Tesla history. Yeah. So for me, I started investing in 2012, and it was because of the car business. And at that time, electric vehicle uh, cars were not around, as you know. And you took a look at this company, huge shot in the dark, very much likely going to go fa fail. but wanted to support it. And you can see that if anybody's going to succeed, it's going to be Elon. It's going to be, you know, the his path and Ford. The car business succeeded, if you look at it from 2012 to 2020. <laughs> if you look at it from 2024, you're going, oh, it's, it's lower. No, it's amazing what has happened to the world. Electric vehicle is now the, the, the winner. There's no debate on this. The world is transitioning to electric vehicle. Every country is doing this. Now, uh, 2020, it's stock shot up. Now the story is, why do you want to still be invested in Tesla when the stock is already 20 times what it was before? And that's where the decision had to be made. And you look at the company and all of those things you said, James, that's exactly what, right? This is no longer a car company. You know that the energy, they have a path for that. Um, I don't think they were talking about the bots yet, but you can see that you know their path forward is just going to be an innovation engine with multiple different products and every two year every year they announce yet a new product and that's what i take the bet on right and then here we are and you know you're hoping that fsd would happen he was talking about the from 2015 but you can see the progress and yet you can see the disappointment it, it doesn't matter if one of those things doesn't happen what matters is is this company innovate do they create a new potential product that has massive market by the way these are the, they're addressing the biggest markets you could possibly get if and then yep. eventually one of them will succeed and they are all all of them are actually on path forward so it's like people are very disappointed right now they're going fsd hasn't happened yet but you're saying this today when fsd 12 has been released it's actually end-to-end -end neural net that's actually showing signs of actually being the that's you know the, the other thing that's going to solve that's you're, you're saying perfect. this today when energy is now a real thing that's actually just showed you last quarter that it's actually got the margin like material 
to the business already. And as Larry is pointing out, it's going to double next year and double further than that. You're saying to this today, when you've got the bot, they do the Gen 2, and you can now see that this thing's real. This isn't just a pie in the sky prototype anymore. They've shown that the AI, as you have been watching with, you know, the open AI and all the advancements there, that it's it's not that no one anymore is concerned that you can't teach a bot to do activities and, and the kind of things you can do with AI is so much. So it's like, it's funny that the, the people are so concerned about Tesla today when every single part of the business is probably hitting out of the park, that stock is not reflecting it, the margins are low, you have to be patient. But you know what I'm saying? If you look at it from the business side, I'm trying to figure out where exactly was the mistake. Oh, the Cybertruck was delayed by a couple of years. Oh, you should have done the, the Gen 2 compact card the year before. But they're telling you how they're going to do the Gen 2, the unbox model. They've got the factories being rebuilt. You know what I mean? Like, it's like it, it, if they were saying, I'm going to do the Gen 2, but I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have to like figure out how to cut the cost, but you didn't have a path to cut the cost, I'd be worried. Right now, yeah. none of us are worried that they're going to hit the, the lower price point. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, tell me one part of the business that is actually truly failing. Um, and the solar, solar. Yes, solar. solar. Yeah, but, I but, truly but, agree but, with that one. Yeah. Herbert, you're talking with, I won't call it perfect knowledge, and James is giving us, I won't call it perfect knowledge, I would say that the two of you are highly informed shareholders, highly informed. The market is not a highly, you know, the market just is a voting machine. Whatever's pretty today gets the vote today. In the long term, it's a weighing machine and will weigh all of these things as they come to pass. So, you know, I know a lot of people are expressing a huge amount of frustration at the moment. I just think to myself, we're so lucky. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they yeah. don't know. They don't understand it. This is like being in 2015, 2016 all over again. They're giving us a And even mark. better. And even yes. better because there are so many waves coming. In 15, you saw my, maybe the three is coming, right? Now you see so many. And I mean, I don't even need to tell you. Everybody can see them if they do a little bit their yeah. homework. So, uh, yes, and you're right. Other, that's, that's, too, is the, the Lindy effect as well. The risk is far, far, far lower than what I had in 2017 and even exactly. 2019. Financials uh, are strong. Everything yeah. is there. Exactly. And, and getting okay. back to the original question, Herbert, which I know we didn't answer regarding why is the stock so low? I, I, mm -hmm. I sum it up in kind of uh, the primary reason for the Wall Street analysts is kind of Tesla's lack of clear guidance and communication after the CFO's departure. We all know that. Then, of course, the market dynamics, it's FUD after FUD after FUD and the mainstream media piles on. You know the arson in Germany, etc., which is terrible. I hope I hope Germany doesn't become like California, where they're not tough on crime, and uh, again, absence of future outlooks. If the analysts don't have that thing to pencil into the little box and know where the price is going, they're not going to make it. And this is why, as Larry said, it's like a gift to retail investors that do the work and study and see what they have at their fingertips. It is a blessing, and I've noticed as well over the past. Yeah three or four years that retail investors are much smarter than Wall Street analysts and they can front run them the whole time. Tell me about so. it. I know one who sold yesterday, but there we are. <laughs> but having said that, I think the four of us, I, does anybody have a, co a counter to the comment that it's going to be a down year for this year, 2024? Yeah, I and I heard you said say, that, Alexander, there's no catalyst for 2024 and 25. Well, I, yeah, I'm not saying that. none. I'm I'm saying none. But remember, at the beginning of the year, you asked me, "Will this year be, you know, 400, 500 dollars?" And I said, "I will be happy if we get to 300." So I really, you know, I don't see much cashable, you know, where the money is really on the bottom of the the profitability, um, wh which will make big movements in the stock price and it doesn't matter if you're a long-term investor we have the time to accumulate further and if you can't sit it out this year well you shouldn't be in tesla you shouldn't be in tesla if this is a one-year investment for you that's that's not the way to go mm -hmm. you know i i i just think that um it the future stock price on tesla is unknowable i personally would be quite comfortable to see tesla see out the year at the 170 to 200 220 price mark 
it's going to fluctuate. It's going to be very bad in the first quarter. The second quarter will depend on actual quarterly deliveries. You know, and, and the other thing is a lot depends upon energy and how much profit gets released from the reserve account in the first quarter of this year. It could be actually quite a lot of money. I was just looking at a little bit ago. It could be over a billion dollars. So the first quarter profit in revenue could be, you know, could be as much as a couple of million, a couple of billion dollars, which, by the way, is not, is not, you know, cheap, small change uh, anymore at, at, because it falls to the bottom line or, or falls to net profit. So there are a few things that, you know, could mitigate the situation. But I frankly wouldn't be surprised to see the stock mosey along at that price. But I'm not prepared to sell. My goodness, things could happen, you know, overnight. Overnight. Remember the Hertz announcement? Boom. You know, I mean, remember the charging announcement? Boom. Things can go crazy. And if they go crazy, there's, you know, plenty of opportunity for it to maintain that price range. So I, I don't trade in the stock. I know a lot of people do. Um, and have, and things can go crazy the other way yeah, around as well. Larry. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I, I have traded at the end of quarter because it's so predictable, but it, I don't really like doing that. Yeah, and I actually made a video about why I believe, and like a tinfoil hat theory as to why Tesla's keeping the price low. They have, by my calculations, about three billion in unrealized revenue and warranties that they can release if they wanted to, mm. but they don't want to. They want to keep price low so they can retain employees, attract employees. They want to give loyal retail investors an edge. They want to buy enough time so they can renegotiate the Elon Comp package. And finally, uh, this is going to sound a bit rude, but give Wall Street the proverbial finger. <laughs> Because, <laughs> like, I think they're kind of my theories as to why they're trying to. And it is working. And it is yeah. working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, explain uh, that to me. How do you give the Wall Street a finger? Like, well, by not playing their game. Rising. By not playing their game, not giving them what they want, yeah, not living quarter to quarter. Let them all sell at these yeah. low prices and I see. in the market. But, yeah. you know, I think this is a tinfoil, tin hat, was it tinfoil hat theory? theory. I, yeah. I honestly don't think Elon gives a. Yes, I, I really don't. I mean, you hear him on those, uh, you know, I, I attend those shareholder calls, but I hate it. I just hate it. And he does really, too. And he does yeah, he too. Does. Yeah, exactly. I hate it more than he hates it, actually. <laughs> but so, the so, only good shareholder call we ever had was when Zach took the call and not t not Elon. And and just, you know, Guru Focus, uh, one of the so yeah. systems I use, they have a value of 390 bucks on on Tesla stock, and they're super conservative in how they appraise stocks. Super conservative. And that shows you where we are. And last I saw, we were trading at a PE of 44 on 2024 earnings. Yeah. For what for what they have in the hopper, it's insane. Yeah. It's like the most it's like buying Walmart at a PE of two. And know? James, that's that is a brilliant statement because if you talk to a PE to to Investment manager, PM, uh, uh, portfolio manager. What what the hell say to use forty four? I mean, Nvidia's trading lower than that. Yeah. Why would I buy Tesla? I'm yeah. going to sell Tesla to buy Nvidia because they have a lower. I mean, it's like it's you know it's kind of nuts. So yeah, it's, it's and then it's they'll talk about Ford <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Ford trades at a P is six or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're going to be dead our, in six years. <laughs> no, no, no. You and me will pay the taxes to bail them out. Don't you worry. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let's talking about you know Tesla. Are we people that have fallen into this trap of studying it so much, believing in it so much, and then some people will say you are a cult. You know, you've got to that point. And uh, there's this great analysis that CERN Basher did where he compared. Tesla to uh, to Bitcoin. So we're going to do that. We're going to talk about Tesla Bitcoin. If we have time, we'll talk about FSD insurance and then the shareholder letter that Alexandra spearheaded on behalf of Tesla. So this is the post that Sir Basher did. When it comes to Tesla, which one are you, right? Are you a denier, a skeptic, a trader, an investor, or a maximalist? Okay. And then 
when somebody answered, so for example, here's one example, Warren Redlich, who's a very well-known Uber bull for Tesla. He said, I'm a maximalist, right? I'm already there. I'm already at the point where I'm totally a maximalist. I think you should put in as much money as possible into the stock. So then CERN asked them, did you get through the earlier steps in order to get to where you are first? How much work and effort did you take to get you to where you are now? And so Warren explained his story, right? 2012, he wasn't a skeptic, but he was growing curiosity. 2016, he became an investor. And 19 and onward, he became a maximalist. But he did that. He developed his conviction by studying it after the SpaceX. And then after doing Autonomy Day, Battery Day, gave him his models, AI Day, Investor Day, Fundamentals. And that's how he came up with, okay, this is a really big, important company. I better invest as much as I can. So then CERN explains that this question that he asked actually is the same question that Michael Saylor asked about Bitcoin. Did he ask those Bitcoin supporters, are you this? And so then CERN says, you know, the Tesla community has so much passion for Elon Musk and the Tesla's team. And this is not unlike what you see, the passion that the Bitcoin investors and community have. Tesla has a master plan, right? That service is guiding blight. Well, Bitcoiners have this paper called the, the Satoshi's white paper. They, you know, these are religious texts. Um, Bitcoiners see many Tesla fans as cultists and many Tesla fans see Bitcoiners as, tes as cultists. So to the outside world, both seem like cults. And then dissing, dismissing some people as cultists is a lazy put down. Chances are those doing the dismissing have not really studied Tesla or Bitcoin, therefore do not have the proof of work, the work that they did to really believe in their conviction. And then some people then attack Tesla and Elon as doing evil. And the same thing has happened with Bitcoin. People think that Bitcoin is criminal activity or too much energy arguments. And then both Tesla and Bitcoin are trying to change the world, but they face entrenched interest. So um, there's division within. So as even within Tesla as well, we have these communities that are arguing as well with us. So that's what he's thinking, that just uh, we're very similar to the way the Bitcoin stories. So James, you are investor in both the Bitcoin industry and the world, as well as Tesla. Yeah. Tell us uh, how you think of it. So first of all, CERN Basher has a beautiful mind. Uh, Especially point number five, the attack vectors, same thing. Um, and I used to say for years, many people have said this too, like Bitcoin is like an IQ test. You get it at the price you deserve and you have to do the work. You have to study for like a thousand hours to really get it. And once you get it, especially if you get it early, the penny drops early, you do very well. But I, I love this because the, the parallels between Bitcoin and Tesla are immense. What's very bizarre is Bitcoiners hate Tesla and Tesla people don't touch Bitcoin. It's very rare you'll mm -hmm. find people having both, unless you guys are exceptions here at this table. I am in both because I like disruption. And I see I spend all my time trying to have a long-term vision of what can disrupt the world. Uh, they are both technology-based to a large extent. They are both, as you say, community-driven. Both Bitcoin and Tesla investors form very strong. All, they're very passionate, let's just say, about their assets. And again, going back to disruption, they're both going to change the world in a big way. Um, and uh, I think one of the most exciting moments I had in my life was when Tesla bought Bitcoin. I thought, ta-da! That makes complete sense. So yeah, uh, they're both IQ tests. When he said proof of work, that's a big part of what Bitcoin is. But you have to do the work to understand what's going on. And that's why I obsess about disruptive assets, because that's how you get the most alpha. You do not, you do not make any money following Wall Street analysts. Right. You got to be in before them. Over to you guys. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm aligned 100%. I do think, though, that a lot of people complain about the Bitcoin versus the Tesla. I think there are a lot more people who are aligned with both Bitcoin and Tesla. And the example of that is ARK Invest. You know, Kathy yes. Wood has been a very strong um, proponent of both for, for the right reasons. And I think people who are intellectually attracted uh, to Tesla as opposed to, you know, gut reaction, gut feel. I think people who are intellectually uh, attached to Tesla as an investment uh, can can and do intellectually appreciate the value of Bitcoin. So I, I think there are two kinds of people 
you know, in broadly, in very broad terms. So in, in that degree, I, I do disagree a little bit. But yeah, I mean, my question to everybody who who dumps on Bitcoin is, you know, they tell me there's no value to Bitcoin. What's behind Bitcoin? I said, here's a dollar bill. What's behind this? What in this magic piece of paper is value? Where, where's the value? What's What's behind it? Well, they tell me the full faith and credit of the United States government. I said, well, how's that different from the full faith and credit of the uh, of, of the citizens of the world <laughs> behind Bitcoin? I mean, I you're talking about an abstract thing that's supposedly behind the dollar bill. Well, it's the same abstract thing behind a Bitcoin coin. And and the, the proof of work is a whole nother conversation. But it's it's that simple to me. Yeah, well, well it, but what, it's, what's behind what, what, so what, what's behind Bitcoin is the largest computer system on the planet. People forget that. So, yeah, uh, I mean the the issue for me, I'm, I'm probably just too old, but I don't see the value of Bitcoin. But I haven't done the homework, so you know, I'm probably one of those deniers or skeptics that just didn't do the homework. Why didn't I do the homework? I was initially my first job at Deutsche Bank was. Um, working with the Forex dealers who were dealing currency. And behind that, each currency I, I had to learn, I was right straight out of my studies. You know, there was an economy behind it. There was a value behind it. There was the dollar value of a McDonald's in this currency and in that currency. And, and that's how I was brought up. So maybe it's still that old thinking that prevents me to see the value behind Bitcoin because there's no economy behind it. There's a computer behind it and there are people who want it and it's a scarcity. I see all that, but I don't see, you know, the intrinsic value of it that once that scarcity wouldn't exist. I mean, I know you all made it so it does exist but it just it doesn't give me the, the same the same feeling of um something allow, solid and tradable allow me to ask you a question sure you said there's a whole economy behind it hmm. how do you determine the amount of hamburgers or the amount of production behind a peso or a, a real or a dollar well, it, it is determined like any stock, like anything by trade, right? Thank and you. the Hold trade. On. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. So Bitcoin is the product of a huge amount of work, compute work. I mean, huge amount of work. I don't actually agree that it's the largest computer system in the world. I know that's been said. I think, honestly, the communication system is the largest, but we can agree to to debate the 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 but there's a huge amount of work behind the bitcoin but that's not what gives the dollar or the real a value and so if you is think it? it is you you really need to go back your your economics books because economics 101 there's no more value to the dollar or the real or the pound or the whatever currency you want to choose but the value that the market will pay for it. Yeah, the trade. And that's sure. exactly what's behind Bitcoin. That's yeah, but the, trade, but the trade of a currency, let's say, because I, I lived through the devaluation of European currencies before it became the euro, right? At those moments when, when politicians decided or central bank, which was then still politicians, uh, decided to devalue uh, a currency, it got devalued. So it wasn't just the market. There was, there was, you know, a country behind it. You are digging your own grave. Oh, I would, would I? The beauty about Bitcoin, <laughs> the beauty about Bitcoin is because is yeah, politicians exactly. can't decide what the currency is. The reason it sure. was not reflective of the value is simply because politicians kept pumping it up. And that happens today as well. By the way, it's no different today just because mm -hmm. we haven't devalued it. So Bitcoin yeah. is a perfect market, a perfect market because there's no government can pump it up or devalue it. And that's, the, that's why you're digging your own grave if you're arguing that there are governments behind these pieces of paper. These pieces of paper are nothing but what people are prepared to accept. Those pieces of paper are worth for any good they're prepared to exchange for it. And that's true of Bitcoin. Yeah. And Bitcoin has it's had the resilience to prove that over a very large period of time. I'm not look, I'm not a Bitcoin nut. I'm not like James, I'm not a 
serious investor in Bitcoin. But I don't understand why people can be down on Bitcoin because to me, it's no different from a dollar bill. It just, in the dollar yeah. bill, the US government is promising to pay. In Bitcoin, the market is promising to pay. I trust the market. And, I think and there the are beauty. obviously. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, James. I could talk about Bitcoin for hours, but I'll try to summarize it into three simple things. Obviously, the limited scarcity. Um, there's only 6% left to be mined over the next 120 years, right. which is kind of stunning. It is completely decentralized, as Larry said. There is no CEO, there's no officer. It's just independent, decentralized network that runs. And it is the most powerful computer system on the planet. Also, you can transfer a billion dollars for a dollar. Billion dollars for a dollar. You just have to wait 10 minutes for it to be confirmed. And over 120 million people use the network. And if you know Metcalf's law, that it determines the actual value. So it is a stunning piece of technology. And uh, just like Tesla, the people that get Tesla, if you look at the people that get Bitcoin, they also tend to be very, very smart and they've done the work. Like even Michael Saylor, who you mentioned earlier, uh, he's been on my channel many times. Um, he was a skeptic. And then he saw money printing happening in the year 1999, 2000, or 2020, 2019. He said, uh, I've got $100 million of cash here in my business. I need to do something with it. I don't want to hold on to this exactly. melting ice cube. Where do I do with it? So that's that's basically what it is. And now you got Larry Fink in there, biggest money runner on the planet. He wouldn't embrace it if it wasn't real. So anyway, I'm not here to justify Bitcoin. <laughs> I may learn. So I'm talking about... Bitcoin and Tesla. So obviously there are many different kinds of investors in Tesla. The same thing with Bitcoin. So I am a, just like you guys, uh, I'm a disruptive technology person. I look for disruptive technologies. And so I am attracted to Bitcoin. So there's some of us who are Tesla investors who are disruptive technology people. And that's why we did that. And then there's many now, right? Who started to invest in it after 2020 when it skyrocketed. They're trying to get in the FOMO. They're trying to understand the business. They're really more about the car business, more, more mature of a company. Um, but for disruptive technology, I am attracted to Bitcoin. I was very much uh, studying it at the very early days. I dabbled very little, but I felt that it was it was like it's funny because it's actually the even more disruptive. Even the the thing that's more disruptive, the more volatile it is, the more risky it is. And that was where okay, I, I look at Tesla, and I don't I didn't compare Tesla versus Bitcoin. I'm just saying that when I look at Bitcoin, I saw two risky, huge rewards. And that's what exactly happened. Some people did very, very, very well, but very, very risky right. versus Tesla, which is definitely very risky in the early days. But as we just talked about now, I scratch my head when people think that Tesla is still risky. Certainly, if you're thinking about buying a 200 and it's going to fall to 100, then that's risky. But it's not likely at this point to go out of business anymore, like go to zero. And it's very it's strong balance sheet, strong, uh, you know, f assets and products are the best in the world, all that stuff. So it's like, you know, like the risk is much more controlled than everything. But that's why I didn't get into Tesla or Bitcoin. But there certainly is a good group of people. But I think they were the early investors in Tesla that are that were there for disruptive. I'm not so sure anymore. So th there's rumors this morning coming out that Tesla mm -hmm. might actually buy more Bitcoin. I know Ed Crescentine said this, but I think he did this because, again, there's just a few people talking about it, I suppose. I did not hear this rumor. Um, what do you guys think about this? Highly doubtful. Mm. I think they have enough. I th and I think they learned the lesson that it could also go down because, remember, the accounting standards are that now it has to be valued at this lowest price since they were holding it until they sell it. Nope. Oh, it's over? Yep. That, so things have changed. Oh, good. And um, now it's really valued just like a, a, a Any stock. asset? Okay. Yeah. And in any case, they could uh, definitely buy one of the funds. They don't have to buy the coin. They could buy one of the funds, and then, then sure. that definitely is valued as a share. So those days are over. I'm surprised they didn't revalue the Bitcoin in the last uh, financials, but it could well come in this quarter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, clearly in the last quarter they hadn't sold any because they didn't realize any profit and they would have had to realize a profit. But the day where they have to mark down 
um, the value ha has passed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so James, so, for somebody who trades both Bitcoin and uh, Tesla, would you recommend Tesla to buy more Bitcoin? I think uh, yeah. Elon Elon knows enough about it to know that it's probably a little too late for him to buy. He buys it cheap, like twenty five to thirty k, not at nearly seventy thousand dollars a pop. And by the way, we came from fifteen and a half to seventy thousand dollars almost in a very short window of time. But it was just also noted today from a company called Arkham that they've identified the Bitcoin wallets for both Tesla and SpaceX. The beauty of Bitcoin, which is also a negative thing, it's public; it's all on an immutable ledger out there in the in the wild. But uh, Tesla has eleven thousand five hundred Bitcoin across 68 addresses, it's worth about $800 million. And SpaceX have about 8,300 Bitcoin worth about $600 million approximately. And they've made over half a billion on their Bitcoin bag. So it hasn't been a mistake to allocate some of their melting ice cube cash reserves to Bitcoin. And they did this as well during the ZERP, the zero interest rate environment. So that was kind of a clever thing to do. And half a billion more of of other credits they have. They got unrealized revenue from mega packs. They've got warranty billion dollars sitting there too. Add it all up, it's over four billion dollars that they could peter out into share prices if they want, but they're not going to do that because they're giving the finger to you know who. My conspiracy theory. Not a bad theory. James. I'm, yeah, I'm, I love it. I'm yeah. not a conspiracist, but it's not a bad theory. But you know they have their reserves right now in the energy business is over three and a half billion dollars. Oh, I thought it was three. So it's even more. Wow. Yeah, yeah. and that was from one year of one year of yeah. selling mega packs. Because you know. and Larry, can you explain to the audience why it's because they can't realize the revenue until they turn on the mega packs? Isn't that correct or something? It's all speculation right now. I think it's um, commitment as to performance over t over time. Uh, that's a portion of the purchase price. So, I think there's an important tranche when they get on the grid. So, you know, there's a deposit, there's a delivery tranche. That, that, that's a separate tranche. That's not the three and a half billion. There is, there is quite a lot of money there. There's about a billion, almost two billion dollars yeah. in that tranche. And that's simply they can't realize the money until they've delivered. On the grid. The three and a half billion is all on performance. So there are two tranches totaling almost five billion dollars. Oh, good. So that may be like the auto bidder tranche, or just... no? I don't believe it's auto bidder. I believe it's performance. I think it's you know they have to prove the performance. Okay, interesting. I didn't and realize. Auto bidder. Right now, they only have one major auto bidder contract. I mean, where they participate in the profits or the losses, and they don't realize that in advance. And that's in Australia. That's in South uh, in Victoria. So, we'll see how that runs because that could be a great business for the future. But but the you know the performance reserve in um, in 2023 was 3.43 billion, and the revenue and the unrealized revenue for against delivery was one point. I've got it somewhere. One point eight or so billion. So it's about 5.2 billion, of which we'll see definitely at least a third. They, they said in their in their K10, uh, 10K uh, that 1.1 billion is likely to be recognized in the next 12 months. So if you add that, like a rough back of the head, my small little brain mathematics, that's a dollar fifty, dollar seventy five a share. That's what's my takes point. Takes us to six bucks a year, which takes us to what's the PE now, Larry? Thirty something. I, so. You're singing my song. I, I'm right there yeah. with you, James. I'm yeah. what Just I was that alone. About, it's already one eighty. Wall yeah. Street was saying, not what I was saying. Wall Street was yeah. saying, let them talk. Let them talk. We're laughing in the back. Exactly. Do you guys think down. that? Do you guys think that Tesla is being too conservative? Because you know that Elon said that he's got PTSD. He was very careful. Okay, that was a oh, several months is. ago. He is. So today, he is. And that's why you don't. Point, but at some point, Tesla should throw much more money, be much more aggressive in either, you know, AI, data warehouses. Yeah. They should do it possibly for five. But did you hear the new amount? Did you hear? Did you hear that new amount? I was thinking of you actually straight away, Herbert, because 
both you and me had said that about a couple of, of uh, months ago when they had announced so the, there was a capex limit between five and seven and they said well now it will be yeah. over seven and both of us said it should be much more um yeah. all this discussion with people thinking we should do a buyback and we're like you're going to be kidding we need all this money and there's so much to be done and um and, her, and larry larry had a famous space with uh gary and yeah, me he's... and he was he was my soldier, no. there he was. Um, so, so to to uh, let you know, so Monday was an um, investor relation meeting with quite a lot of analysts. We've only heard of one oh. so far, but there were actually loads of them. Uh, and uh, that triggered the adjustment of the price from Adam Jonas and, and all that. So there, there were all these things. Oh. It was one meeting. It was no, one Jeff, meeting. Jeff Kilberg, Jeff Kilberg of this investment analyst was on TV and he said $10 billion, uh, Tesla's going to spend $10 exactly. billion in AI. Capex. And, and the I 10 go, billion. we go, where did he get that number from? No, no, that's it. it right, that's right, that meeting. Right, guys, guys, oh. It's in the 10K. It's in the 10K. The 10K didn't say 10 yet. No, oh, it yes, didn't say for that. AI. It absolutely does. The 10K says. It does, does not it? say for AI, Larry. It was, yeah. they increased their R&D to 10 thing to 12. On Monday. Yeah. No, 10 no. to 12, but they never said it was for AI. And I'm like going, 10 to 12 is not enough. No, they no, need the to spend 10, more the for AI. It does not distinguish the difference in money. It just tells you how much money they plan to spend in 2024. And it says $10 million. What 10, million, 10 to 12. Yeah, 10 to 12 billion, billion. Billion, yeah. I think it's 10 billion, but um, I, I look it up. But the, 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 what bothers me and what really bothers me was what they said in the same 10K, in that same paragraph, that it will decline after 2025. My numbers show it's going to increase dramatically of, uh, between 2024 and 2030. So I, I just, it bothers me because what they say in the 10K is at odds with what they say in the master plan. The master plan is very clear. They've spent 28 billion, they have to spend 125 to 150 billion. And you know, there's a, the time scale. And if you do the numbers, they have to spend more than 12 billion, $15 billion. So I, I'm just bothered by that. Can I read it to you from the 10K? Sure. Mm -hmm. So it says, all other continuing infrastructure growth and varying levels of inflation. We currently expect our capital expenditures to exceed 10 billion in 2024 and be between 8 and 10 billion in each of the following two fiscal years. Yeah, that's what bothers me. I knew it said 10, but but I, what bothered me was the 8 to 10 in subsequent years. Because yes. in my book, it's dramatically more. And, and for me, the 10 billion was including also, you know, capital expenditure for building yeah, new sites yeah. and whatever. And Monday, and there were multiple analysts, not just one, saying 10 billion for AI. No, I, I, that 10 billion for AI is not in one year. That is not that in could one be. year. That it's could be. That could be. It's over a period of time. And that 10 billion is part of the long term plan. Of that, oh. I'm convinced. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the same thing, but different vantage points. Got it. That 10 billion is definitely over time. Okay. Well, because on top of it, I mean, you know how he more. is, Elon. Yeah, but yeah, well, because that's what he is, Elon, lean and mean, right? I mean, when he comments on how much Apple is throwing out of the window or meta or whatever, every time, I remember when he saw the, I published his research and development numbers that I got from the different uh, Mac, 7, uh, Mac 7, and he was like, you know, having these big eyes. And I thought, yeah, the others are throwing money, but not in the same efficient, lean and mean way than, than Tesla does it. There is no doubt about it. But they are stacking up. We're moving from five to seven to seven to 10, now to exceeding 10. So, and I agree with you, Larry, and it, it next two years will not be eight to 10. It will be but more. There's been a pattern. And the pattern is we always announce a lower figure in the future years, and then we increase it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm pretty confident of my pattern. I had a long argument on, on, on X about this. I don't see a reduction in capital expenditure. In fact, mm -hmm. I've plotted out in the future against the master plan. We have to get to something like $30 billion ultimately in one year mm -hmm. around about the 29, 28, 29 time frame. Larry, those buyback guys, they're just going to hate you more and more. Yeah, I love them. 
Gives you, gives you. I, I'm, uh, guess what, Alexander? I'm interviewing Nicholas Colas tomorrow. Again? No, oh, I love it. I love the guy. Yeah. And uh, he's going to make the case, which I'll publish it this weekend. He's going to make the case right. that, um, yeah, not only should you not do the buyback, you should raise 20 plus. I know. Million, and Larry and me have say, been agreeing with him for weeks. I agree with that too. Yeah. What do you think, James? Have you heard of this concept that uh, Tesla should actually raise 20 billion now? Do it now. Stock can take well, it. Well, it depends. I think one of the most amazing things about Tesla and Ron Barron nails it is their capital efficiency is second to none. They invest a billion, they create three billion. It's just bonkers. So why? I mean, I mean, they could, but they have what 30 billion already on the sidelines right now. Do they need another 20? Well, um, maybe they are soon and- paying six billion to a lawyer, right? No, I'm joking. And the, the, don't get me started about that thing. That just upsets me. That criminal set of those three <laughs> law firms, they are <laughs> – I had a conversation with a friend about them, and they profile them, and they said it's just shocking that the U.S. legal system allows that to happen. Incredible. And you know Elon Musk is disgusted. That's why yeah. he was all over your post as well. Great job as well, Alexandra. I mean – this is this is the USA today. It's literally unless something changes oh. between easy on crime and easy, uh, you know, manipulating the laws to screw people and shareholders like us. It, James, it is just James, James. really James. You know, I moved here to this wonderful, blessed country ten years ago, and no, no second of regrets, not one. But one thing I can tell you: Europe is crippled by its bureaucrats, but America yes. is crippled by its lawyers. That's yes. just yeah, a true. fact. That's and true. and I, I can tell you, it's such a shame because the machine of academia is throwing out hundreds of thousands every year. Again, they all need to make their money. The mean ones make more money. It's just that is the big crux of the matter. You know, I would I would actually add a rider to that. I think what you said is true. was true. I think now the United States is crippled not only by its lawyers, but by its academia. Mm. Yes, the, acad- the academy has become corrupt. Yeah, and, this and, and very- we've seen that. I mean, the, we're going down a very dangerous rabbit hole here. Yeah. I could get very heated very fast talking about <laughs> academia since 2020, and then not just the C19 situation, but then the DEI situation and everything else. Tell it me. is ESG? absolutely. I, I mean, I know, and. It's not. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Yeah. It's all smartest, pulled together. Smartest, it's horrible. Yeah, the smartest well, anyway. people are not as we believed, or and this all ties into the media as well. The media is completely corrupt. TV, yeah. everything is corrupt, and that's yeah. why my dream, my dream, my wish for twenty twenty four was to have truth, and I think that we have got one big truth exposer, and that is X. And I'm very grateful, even though he completely overpaid for it, it has helped the world in a way that we can never measure because he is exposing truth. I have a prediction, James. Yep. And my prediction is probably informed by my investment. I'm an investor in X. My prediction is that X is going to be a phenomenal profit maker for, for Elon Musk. It already is. He doesn't let you know though. Well, you probably know (laughs) being an insider, this thing is a money machine, What he's done with what a fifth of the workforce many more features and grok grok is the only place like if if i need to find out news like i got really upset with the economist magazine i've been a subscriber since 1990 one magazine canceled it this morning because of the drivel that they publish i mean fundamentally flawed point of view that is very much like uh, anyway, you're going to get me too heated. I'm not going to go down this path right now. But the world is very so, broken. And the only hope we have to unbreak it and expose truth to power is X. And it is. We, every one of us should be very grateful that we have mm-hmm. Elon Musk. And I'd be happy buying his stock just to have truth. I don't care if I don't make any money on it. Just to have that truth. That's what the world needs. Yeah. Well, the greatest well, I want to-, to buy the stock and make money. That's it. That's Larry, the wise man. Let's, <laughs> let's get back to the topic of the Delaware court. I want to uh, oh. share what happened. So we know that you know the uh, the, the the plaintiff uh, won 
and the lawyers have asked for five point nine billion dollars. That actually uh, no, that, you know, no, they rescinded. They have, mm, it's a little bit more complicated. So let let me just pull you back where we were Sunday. So Sunday, um, I called for a space because three lawyers agreed to to speak speak up in that space. That space is still pinned in my um, in my feed on on the top. Um, the situation then was we had heard, but we had not received, we have it since, um, the attorney fee motion. So what we had heard then was that they want to be paid in stock 29,402,900 shares. Isn't that cute? They also wanted to have on top of it their expense reimbursement. So that is what really was paid from them of 1.12 million. Okay, so that's that's what million we really need to be million million one yes. 120 yes. 115 50 exactly so but that just gives you also the the difference of weight mm. right and then we have now i think it's 60 pages uh 47 pages sorry i don't want to exaggerate of uh, of their motion on why they deserve this and case law and blah 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 so i was obviously upset but i also know that in the united states um the winner attorney has usually a percentage right this is not uh, a fixed fee but you you have a percentage. So the way they argue is we're saving Tesla from paying 56 billion in in um in options. So these 56 billion return to the shareholder and and to the, the company and so our fair share will be and they state at the bottom of the 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 span that they can use for that calculation, which is between 9 and 25% in Delaware for these type of cases, if you use a certain precedent. I don't want to go into all that. They explained that, on, but whatever. They stayed at, at the 9 to 10% on the lower end of that spectrum, uh, asking for 10% of what was sold. But that's obviously completely absurd for two reasons. One, they started this whole story in 2018. So even if you would have a gain, I get into that in a second, there is no gain, but even if you would have a gain, it would be based on the 2.9 billion that the stock was worth then and not on the 56 billion that it is worth now, right? I mean, that's completely mm -hmm. horrendous. Um, but even, will there be a gain? Of course there will not, because remember two, three weeks ago, we made this whole shareholder letter where we are asking with more than 5,000 shareholders, with more than 22 uh, million shares behind us, saying to the board, board, reinstate this compensation package as soon as you can. That was the main order of that shareholder letter. So the, the whole question is, is will there be an artificial void of, of time between the moment where this first judgment will exist, maybe appealed, we'll see, and this shareholder revote will happen. And does that void give them any access to any compensation? So we discussed that with these three lawyers in that space. The board um, discussing Amicus, which is a you know a lawyer prepared letter representing shareholders. That is still not completely off the table, but there, that's not the topic of today. But we we decided that we needed to do something relatively quickly because we're in the period where. The plaintiff's attorney has given his amount. Out, as outlandish as it is, it is the high watermark, right? That's how much they want. They could have gone for 25%, right? I mean, I'm I'm not saying they're right, but at least we have an amount now. That's the maximum potential loss. And that allowed us to take action and just, you know, discuss it now because it was out there. And now the next mover is obviously Tesla. So we stayed very far from getting in touch with Tesla. We said, okay, this is not about Tesla doing something. This is about us shareholders doing something. And these lawyers proposed all three independently. They all had their reasons. You can all listen to it. It's a 45 minute uh, space of going, uh, do letters from each individual shareholders, very respectful, write them to the, the judge because she's the only one sitting there now. She has the proposal from the plaintiff's attorney who wants all these shares. She will hear something from Tesla, which hopefully tells them to do nothing, to pay nothing and uh, whatever. And so that happens. My gut feeling is there are at least 1,000 letters already on their way to, to Delaware. Some have arrived already. Um, there is also a short period where people were writing emails. Then I was asked to take the email off because they were worried that Tesla Q people would start writing nasty emails to her or pretending to be shareholders but being very insulting or whatever. So I said, okay, they won't take the time to write letters. But anyway, so I think there are thousands and thousands of letters now arriving uh, at the judge's um, 
mailbox and where she will read. There's some very personal stories in there. There are some heartbreaking stories in there. There's some, you know, just respectful stories telling her that she was just completely wrong, but that these blame tips are absolutely abusive. And, uh, and we just hope this does something. Now you have to know, Tesla can ask the judge to have copies of these letters. So we hope they do that. And uh, so that it actually becomes part of the case if ever they want to do an appeal. Uh, it is not as official as an amicus letter that will be actually part of the case if ever it comes to a, an appeal, but it is something that they can't just toss away. Thank you so much, Alexandra. This is a big giant um, support that you led along with Kristen and Amy, making sure that uh, you, know, you organize the shareholders to whatever we can do. And here's Elon. I think this is not his only like. He's liked several four. of uh, four. four times. So he's yeah. supporting what you guys as as representing shareholders. So really does appreciate it. And then um, mainstream media picked this up. This is uh, MSN Benzinga, talking about yeah. and and po Benzinga pointing out that you and the others have also helped doing this. You know, Alexander Mertz, one of the shareholders. Fantastic. Well done. I know you I know you don't Same do this one. for this. I'm just, it's it's me. It's me being very proud of you. Thank you for doing that. And Thank there's you. Tesla Roddy talking about it as well. So yeah, it nice, really nice is uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's made a deal made a big deal. It's not just within our little X community. It's gone out there, it's helped change the narrative. And it's important that you know the judge knows and the world knows that the shareholder support are shocked, as we have been saying mm -hmm. here. This is unbelievable this is even somebody happened. wrote me somebody wrote me another story which was done in 2015 when when potential green card holders were very unhappy with uscis who was who was very very slow in delivering green cards right and putting people at stress so they did then a campaign that all those people waiting for their green cards sent flowers to the uscs office then sent the press there and there was this bed of flowers you know like when lady diana was dead right with all mm -hmm. you know little messages mm -hmm. uscis get me my green card whatever we have yeah. to do stuff that is visual we have to do stuff that moves people it may be stupid initially but that's how you raise awareness so these letters, I think, is going to be the first step. Why Something needed to be done. To the Delaware. There you go. What do you want to send? What did you say, Larry? I said, let's send flowers to the court in Delaware. Right. And just put flowers everywhere and say to her, yeah. you know, be reasonable, lady. I have a very, very negative view of this court case. Oh, I, tell you me. know, I, I think there's political corruption. Mm -hmm. um, oh. I said it openly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do think there is. We so know she that. she yeah. was a partner in a lot, large law firm in Delaware. The head of that law firm has become the governor of De the state of Delaware. We know that there is a close relationship between he and the Bidens. So Lots of donations, think, money, think, money, money. Yeah, well, I mean, also personal friendship. And so I think um, she is within... I, I, I honestly think that if she really believes that there was a personal relationship of negative consequence between some of those directors and Elon Musk, I think she has to recognize that there is at least an appearance of conflict given her position. She should have resigned it herself. Her, completely agree. Yes. Her own self. I'm yeah. absolutely yeah. convinced of that point. Okay. Good. I, think, uh, I think the number is something like 53% of senators are lawyers and 45% of Congress are lawyers as well. But I was thinking, now that we have AI, it can do all the legal work for us for yeah. almost nothing instantaneously. Why do we need lawmakers yeah. anymore? I know. <laughs> and Larry, I saw you have a glass of red wine there. I'm very jealous. <laughs> I've got tea. <laughs> well, yeah. Where, where okay, are you? Herbert. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, How are we I'm doing on the agenda? Time I, I okay. Sort of my heart yeah. stop at four thirty. Yeah, yeah. We're. I think we're we're done. I think this is fun. We normally do another society discussion, but you know what? I think we did that today. We, we did that. We fell into things. it. We did already. <laughs> fell into it already. I mean, this was a powerful conversation. You guys all come in facts and just uh, and opinions. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we are a little uh, cyber bullish today, right? A lot of the bulls uh, were heavy on the bull side. <laughs> That we didn't have fact. Christian. <laughs> we didn't yeah. have Christian, but uh, but that's too bad. You know, it's nice to have uh, both sides of it. But you know, you guys all gave your uh, 
valiant <laughs> descriptions of why you think Tesla is a good investment. And I think there's a lot of Tesla investors who are needing to kind of feel and understand what's happening at this point. And, it, you know, this is this how we all still feel at this point. So again, not investment advice. I, I think very fair. Some people might have moved some money because it is, uh, you know, the, the next, we all agreed that this year, 2024 may not, nothing, you know, no, no, no obvious catalyst coming. So thank you so much, James, for joining us uh, today. You, yeah. Hopefully you'll join us at least once a month, like you said. Then we have Larry Definitely. Goldberg, always uh, great to have you here as well. Definitely. Thanks, one, one, one final thought as well, just uh, just to wrap up for the audience yeah. as well. Remember, the, I think Warren Buffett said this, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. If you have patience in Tesla, you will be rewarded. Let me know if you three agree. Oh, we do. I do agree, but I don't want it to be anybody's inv investment yeah. advice to anybody because everybody not, no. has to determine their own level of risk. Oh, I'm just talking about the, the, the market in general. And I think it's just fascinating. These old proverbs really have never had such bearing as right now. So nothing yeah. but bright times ahead. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Alexandra, as well, and Larry uh, and Herbert. I don't know if, Larry, you remember we met in Austin. Austin, yes. We did. Yes, so yes I, I emailed you as well. I, I, There's a picture of us together. I need to dig up and share it as well. So Yeah, I love it. I, I, yeah. Okay. Well, well thank I'll you, tell everybody. you my story. When I met Larry for the first time, <laughs> I, I was on stage. He was on the audience, and I attacked him. <laughs> <laughs> who would attack we're still Larry? Friends. And who we're was still right? Friends. And who was right? Yes, uh, Larry turned out to be right. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, that is exactly Larry's Larry. always right. Larry's <laughs> always right. I think I made the point to Herbert at that at that moment, and you were on that stage yeah. as well, Alexandra. Alexandra was there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I actually posted in 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 my feed this week. Tesla shareholders have the propensity to hear yeah. Tesla make an announcement and then believe it suddenly. You know, it's come to pass. Whatever they announce mm -hmm. for the future, it's suddenly come to pass, and it's just our natural, you know, enthusiasm. Hubris. That's why yeah, we love it. we love life. That is it. Yeah. 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 And and by the way, it's been mathematically proven as well that optimists make more money than pessimists. Fact. That's true. Exactly. So. Yeah, that's true. And they're prettier. They're usually much prettier. <laughs> All right. Thank we you, are team. the cyber balls. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. See you soon. Bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.